or good day again in the afternoon. Yes? Yes. Yeah, it's on. That's okay. Good. So, after the wonderful stuff this morning, we've got more stuff this afternoon. Surprise. Um, so first, Wes Warner talking about STEM in schools. Thank you, thank you very much, Anne. Um, so, yeah, so um, today what I wanted to you know, showcase is what we do in STEM for our middle school, for our year nine and year 10 students. And we feel that we've got a, a very unique sort of STEM program that we've got um, because of the locality that we're in and could easily you know, translate to here on the Gold Coast as well with some of the projects that we've got. So I want to thank you for coming along and giving up your, your valuable time, especially if you're you know, an educator, you know, still being on the last week of holidays uh, with that. So I also want to hear also from any industry uh, representatives if they feel, you know, if you feel that you know, there are any improvements to the course or you know, why, you know, particular reasons why we've done certain things. Um, so I'm going to look at um, our projects in our year nine, which is our underwater drone project that we have. And also in year 10, where we look at our roller coaster, our solar ovens and our bionic unit that we use as well. So STEM is about understanding the connections uh, between the four academic subjects that we have at the school that make up the acronym that we know as STEM. And we do this through a problem-based learning uh, through the eight steps which are embedded within our teaching. And when an artefact is presented to the class at the start of a new term, for example, maybe the drone, whether it be a roller coaster, whether it be a, a prosthetic arm, uh, it's important for the students to be engaged from that point of view as well as from others' point of view. So really sort of getting that, uh, that rich learning to understand designing something for the user, not for themselves, not for something that looks good. And I think that sort of translates to a lot of industries that uh, we've got to get the students to have that empathy part of the uh, side of things. So considering these other viewpoints is an important aspect to their learning to, and also solving the problem for the particular user. So once the students are engaged, they can start then doing their learning and understanding the problem. We encourage the students to, you know, engage with the community members to try to solve those particular problems or to tr try to truly understand the problem in the first place. They maintain very detailed journals throughout their, their learning journey and these are presented, as I'll show a little bit later, they're presented at a showcase evening. Uh, so at the end of the year, the students in both year nine and year 10, we put on a showcase evening where we invite not only their parents, but also the community members to come along and to actually ask questions to the students about their learning. And they, they have a probably about a two hour showcase evening where they get up and they present their, their learning to the, uh, to the community members. So these journals is where the learning can be had, you know, and when we have these showcase evenings, we, we often find, you know, some of the parents will, you know, love looking at the artifacts that they produce, their underwater drone or their roller coaster, but it's actually the, the research that they present in those journals, you know, where they've come from and so how far they've come to actually truly understand those particular problems that they've researched and how they've gone about to try to solve those, those problems. And finally, when the students believe that they have solved the problem, they, you know, and they often find that there are more complex issues at play. And, you know, and that's something that, uh, you know, a lot of us, you know, when we get into it, you know, tackle a particular problem, we think we have the solution straight away. But when we get to the end, we find that we were, you know, given a bit of a, a, a wrong steer in terms of, you know, trying to solve that particular problem. And they come up with new issues that they have to solve as a, as a result. We found that as a school on the Sunshine Coast that we had, you know, some of the, the best and most accessible waterways in the country, just like the Gold Coast. And we thought, when we started developing the STEM program, we said, well, let's make uh, make the most of it. Let's use this. Now, initially, we were thinking about using aerial drones, but you know, given the the regulations and um, that were coming into being with CASA, uh, we felt that that might be a little bit constrictive for what we wanted to get out of the kids. 
So we decided to get rid of that and we went for this underwater drone project. It primarily comes uh, from uh, a project in Florida in the United States called the Sea Perch Program. And we've developed uh, our program around the, the hardware and developed a, a curriculum from there. So we had some teething problems and the first probably is the biggest one was that we didn't have a pool uh, and it's you know one of those essential sort of things if you're doing an underwater drone project uh, how are you going to test this underwater drone so the the thing that we did to solve that in the short term which we're still using was an 1100 litre industrial bin that we would fill uh, and lock at the end of each day so you know kids couldn't jump into there because of the pool safety and things like that. But after 12 months of using that, uh, the industrial bin started to get a few stress uh, fractures and started leaking. So this year we're trialling um, the 1,000 litre IBCs. You sometimes see them on the back of utes. Purpose built for at least a tonne of water. So we're hoping that they're going to work. We're going to chop off the top. Uh, and actually put a, a hinge there so we can lock it at the end of each day. So again, with that water safety side of things. Um, so we're going to modify several, one of, uh, several of those and, um, and that'll be perfect for our testing before we go out into the open waterway um, with the students. Now, our project wouldn't be possible without community support. Um, and with all of the, the things that we do with it, our STEM, um, we try to get the community support, you know, because of the knowledge that exists in our local community. And we're fortunate to work with a company called Presidian Global. Uh, Presidian Global is a local engineering firm in Caloundra. Uh, and David Baird, who's the CEO, this, he started his company about eight years ago and he had an idea uh, that he thought he could develop an autonomous vehicle uh, for the military and decided to, he never was able to, uh, he, he wasn't a, um, a fitter on turner, he was an engineer. Uh, he started welding and came up with several prototypes. He's now got several contracts with the Australian Army. Uh, they've recently been testing up at Shoalwater Bay when the Americans came over and they're completely autonomous uh, in terms of um, the, the driver can be up to six kilometres away uh, using an Xbox controller uh, and they have, uh, as long as they have some sort of line of sight they can actually be controlling this. They've got several different vehicles that they use. Uh, they can either be carrying equipment uh, they can also be carrying uh, munitions and also uh, land cl uh, landmine clearing as well, identifying where those landmines are. Uh, he's got several, you know, designs there. He's trying to push us to, you know, into new areas, which is really exciting for us, you know, from that point of view. And I think that's the big thing, trying to get that local community and tap into the, the community that we have. So, as I said, you know, our term one uh, was in STEM one, the students had given the, the problem to building an underwater robot to solve a real world problem uh, and they must you know, research. So they have to research the framing of the particular robot um, to the circuitry as well as testing in our water tank, you know, looking at uh, the buoyancy to make sure that it is uh, neutrally buoyant so when they get out in the open water they're not going to expend energy trying to maintain a certain depth uh, within that. So, but all of this with the pro problem-based learning, they, they actually have to, you know, come up with a particular problem that they need to solve with this robot. Uh, and in our initial first year, it, uh, a lot of the students, you know, grappled with the idea of rescuing uh, a particular object at the bottom uh, of uh, the waterway. So, the students were given the um, the PVC pipe, they designed that, uh, they're using their, um, uh, a lot of the things that you'll find from Bunnings, uh, such as your, your 50 mil PVC pipe, uh, your uh, noodle bars, uh, and we use uh, DC motors uh, with this. This is the, the basic design without the motors. Um, we use three motors uh, within there, so we've got our forward direction, um, and our upwards and downwards thrust. Uh, one of the things that we have found that uh, with the motors that the, the thrust uh, isn't as strong as we'd like. So one of the things we might be looking at is delving into uh, propeller pitch 
and working out whether they can you know, look at different propellers to get better thrust uh, within there. So we considered very carefully you know, when we first came up with this whether 14-year-olds you know, are capable enough to solder. Uh, and we felt you know, in liaison with our community groups, with Presidium Global, that they felt 14-year-olds you know, you know, should have the skills. So uh, we went through uh, a lot of training with the students before we let them loose onto the, uh, the soldering. Uh, and they do make lots of mistakes. Uh, it's one of those hand-eye you know, coordination things that uh, they learn to get right by the end of the course, and they're, they're fairly good uh, solderers by that stage. They also have better eyes than 50-year-olds uh, as well, so uh, they're not using the magnifying glass. But they do do, uh, do, do a lot of re-soldering uh, as a result when they're getting that, because they do a lot of testing with the, uh, the multimedia, multimeters. Uh, to make sure that their solder joints are perfect. So we work with our IT team, our uh, technicians, uh, who do a lot of uh, our networking at the school, you know, and they work, you know, so we, we liaise with a whole lot of people, not just our community members, but also with our IT team, our maths teachers, our science teachers coming in as well. So to sort of see the, the project uh, running yeah, here, no. I'll just mute this, but you'll see that um, it was uh, Barbie. This was a, a project uh, that wasn't quite finished because they hadn't put the grappling hook on. They developed, decided that a grappling hook would be far better than trying to try to scoop Barbie up uh, and to bring it back. Um, a lot of the students made a backstory up to why Barbie was at the bottom of the, wa the, uh, the water and um, felt that you know, Ken was involved with it. <laughs> so you see there. So. How it runs, uh, there's a Cat5 cable, um, and the Cat5 cable you know, is, uh, is conveniently um, you know, split with the wires to all of the motors there. And that comes back to the circuit board, uh, to our switches uh, that they can run there, and then we run that from a 12-volt um, a battery uh, that's located you know, on the dry there. So there's a little bit of workplace and health and safety that we want to make sure with the students, but uh, we often, you know, we'll, we are dealing with 12 volts, not with 240 as a result of that there. So our plans for, you know, later this year is where our STEMS 2 students, so these are the students in the, the latter half of year nine, they will be developing a larger project, uh, underwater ROV. So instead of using the DC motors, they're going to be using bilge pumps uh, to get a lot more thrust as a result of it. Uh, and also building their own uh, sensors on top of that. So we're looking at maybe a hydrophone, uh, a self-made hydrophone, recording underwater sounds and having that coming back. Because we're all tethered, we can run it back through the ethernet cord, um, just ziplocking extra cables to that and recording those sounds and then making a database of the sounds of the animals that are actually existing in our canal system and seeing if they can then research to work out what animals those sounds are actually coming from. Uh, some of the students are thinking about putting in their GoPro on there and actually then actually having line of sight so when they've got that rather than because the canals are quite murky then they'll have to have lights. Because we've already got power we can run more power down the, down the line. Uh, for those lights so they can actually get uh, those sensors there as well. So we're hoping to work with local council as well to, you know, to see whether they can use that for the footings of their bridges that they've got through in the many different canals that we've got there on the Sunshine Coast. Now, with our, our link with Presidium Global, um, David has always you know, been a big proponent that our ROV shouldn't be tethered. He said, you know, you've got tethering, you're going to get fouled up. Uh, he, wants us, he wants us to start investigating, looking at ArduSub, and ArduSub, you know, is an autonomous uh, program, uh, you know, through the Arduino project there, and uh, it will, you know, start to solve those particular problems so, um, you know, without being uh, caught up with the, uh, the tethering system. But that's, that's something that's going to involve a lot more, you know, more coding because we don't do any coding at the moment uh, in our drone project at all. So this is looking at probably an extracurricular activity for our students uh, if they want to go ahead with that. And David has said that you know, he would make available you know, his resources and his engineers to help our students as well. So I think that you know, having that, that community involvement is really, really important. 
So, also one of the things that we do with our STEM, we we encourage the students to you know get into many of the different competitions, and we've got the Oricon uh, bridge building competition. Um, has anyone been involved with the, that bridge building competition? So they they build a bridge uh, out of balsa wood, and then they stress test that. Uh, our students uh, last year came 22nd in the country uh, with the amount of weight that this particular uh, bridge that they built, uh, which was, you know, given the fact that, you know, we don't teach bridge building, the students, you know, were able to, you know, research some different techniques to build their bridge and they were quite successful there on the day. When we come into our year 10, we, we move into more specific unitized, you know, each each term we have a different unit as opposed to in year nine we we primarily just look at the underwater drone project so with the the roller coasters this is primarily trying to gear our students up for our physics units um, so they they're given the, the particular problem that they have to uh, deal with um, so they're developing a roller coaster for four to ten year olds uh, that uh, requires enough twists and turns for enjoyment. So there's a bit of mathematics there. They want to make sure that the, the, the forces that are placed upon the people is not enough to make them sick, but also not enough for them to think, oh, this is lame. So they do a lot of research. They get, you know, we're going out to Aussie World, you know, test the, you know, the roller coasters that they've got there. They've all got their phones. They can test the, the different forces that they've got so they can identify what sort of forces that they should be you know, experiencing. So, so we look at that, and so they look at all of the engineering. So at the moment, their, their projects or the artifacts that they create are using just you know, flexible foam tubing. Um, we might look at you know, going a little bit you know, bigger next year in 2021, uh, as opposed to that, because it just gives them a little bit more um, you know, real life when, and heavier balls. So they're actually using just marbles coming down through here. They do a lot of, a lot of um, uh, video analysis, you know, when they're rolling the ball down, so they, when they're plotting it uh, and measuring the different distances so they can pl uh, place that into their different equations as well. Uh, so we often get um, our our maths B teachers coming in uh, and teaching you know, some of the, uh, the equations that are coming through that they're learning. You can see there down the bottom right, uh, that's a, a finished project and you can see the, the written uh, write-up that the students have uh, from their, their artifact. But when we have the, the showcase evenings, we often find that the, uh, the younger siblings come in who are you know, five or six and they're just wanting to you know, play with the roller coaster and generally by the end of the night after the showcase, those roller coasters are quite trashed, uh, much to the disappointment of the students who actually you know, spent an entire 10 weeks you know, creating the, uh, the project in the first place. Uh, so they do a lot of, uh, with their, their journaling that they're doing, they do a lot of their, their speed trials, they record those, uh, they're constantly testing to make sure that they don't have any atypical results, uh, you know, with that. And often before the showcase evening, you know, they get their, their, their friends, their peers, you know, come in and do a little bit of testing and, you know, are making sure that the, the, the artifacts will stand up to the night. Now, our second unit uh, that we have, uh, that we do, so in term two in year 10, is we do a bionics and prosthetics unit. So again, with this problem-based learning uh, approach that we do with our students, we encourage the students to interview, go out in the community to you know, ask people, well, what is the problem that we need to solve? What, you know, most of our students are able-bodied students. So they're trying to work out, you know, for them to actually truly solve that problem, they need to understand, they need to have the empathy of those people who may not be able-bodied, you know, and need a problem to solve. So we get the students out there. So we get them to try to, you know, you know we, well, 
as teachers, we try to tap into their knowledge because some of them actually have siblings that they're looking after that may not be, or even parents you know, that have a particular problem. And we have had a situation where we had uh, a young boy whose uh, younger sibling had um, Parkinson's, no, not Parkinson's, um, a particular problem where they couldn't pick up the, the spoon there. So, and there was a, a project that was done where it would use a uh, gyroscope to try to keep the spoon at a level, level place. So they were able to sort of you know, tap into that sort of knowledge to bring towards you know, something that they could hold there. So we try to tap into or get the students to you know, understand the similarities uh, between myoelectric, you know, so the electric properties of muscles and how they work, and also mind control uh, bionics. You know, so whether they can you know, tap into that sort of research to you know, develop their, their bionic or their prosthetic that they've got there. So we use a lot of flex sensors uh, with this, uh, do a lot of 3D printing uh, in Arduino to make their hands work. But before we do that, we do a lot of, you know, uh, paper prototyping or cardboard prototyping. You can see down the bottom left, uh, you can see uh, we've got the sort of hand model there with the, uh, the string. Just try, So the students start to analyse exactly what is the hand actually doing there. Um, there's been a lot of other work you know, in other places looking at what if we actually had a sixth digit if we had a second thumb, you know, what could we actually do as a result of that uh, on that one, uh, one hand there? So the students have looked at that. We we're also very fortunate that uh, we had um, a engineering student from the local university who had an interest in biomedical and he was you know, developing a few things on a bionic where he would put sensors in there. So he would have a temp temperature sensor on a bionic hand. He would also have an inbuilt watch you know, and other things and other sort of sensors there. So it gave the students a bit of an idea of sort of like, it doesn't just have to be an exact replication of a hand. What other enhancements, what other augmentation that we can actually do uh, with that bionic that could actually help the user? But again, it comes back to understanding you know, the person that they're trying to help in the first place. So that person that we, uh, that we had there was uh, Tim Marnie. Um, so he had that interest in that medical field and he comes and speaks to the students you know, and shows his prototypes and gives the, the students a bit of an idea of where they can go from there uh, because there's a lot of you know, uh, files out on the internet already to do that sort of 3D printing of hands and things like that. One of the things that we try to encourage the students is not to 3D print at school. Uh, we try to outsource that you know, and get the kids really into fast prototyping, the cardboard prototyping first before getting into the 3D printing. We try to leave that towards the end mainly because of time constraints. We, we only have, uh, with our year 10s, four lessons a week. Um, and obviously with you know, certain weeks, you lose days because of you know, swimming carnivals, and, you know, athletics carnival and things like that. So in our third term, we look at a light and optics uh, unit. So the students you know, develop, a, a, again, a range of prototypes. They've got to solve a particular problem, uh, whether it be lighting, looking at um, in, um, the mirrors there. Uh, we had students last year, I don't have photos here, but we had a student who developed uh, an under, under skateboard lighting so uh, he could actually skate at night. So he had a forward light, he had down light, so he could you know, easily be identified you know, at a distance. Uh, he had that on a rechargeable uh, lithium ion battery. We had another student who uh, used uh, lights on his rims so he could uh, you know, just light up the bike a lot better at night time rather than just having the forward light and the rear red light, uh, just about you know, bike safety. Uh, because where he lived, there wasn't that many uh, you know, streets, uh, street lights, so he wanted to make sure that he was as safe as possible uh, riding at night. So again, you know, they do a lot of that research uh, about the particular problems uh, there. And again, it, it works in with our Year 11 physics uh, unit you know, when they're starting to you know, look at the various different um, you know, uh, uh, electronics that they're, they're working with. Uh, and in our final year of uh, Year 10, um, we will undertake a project where we're looking at surveillance and monitoring of the biodiversity on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, so looking at um, 
uh, a motion detection camera uh, that they're going to put into the local area uh, in the various uh, paperbark forests that we've got, which are fast disappearing uh, with new supermarkets coming online and you know, new developments. Uh, through there. But what we're hoping to do is not just actually have this as a project for the kids, you know, for this year, but use this data and actually relay this back to council. Uh, because what we're wanting to do is we're actually wanting to see what animals over a longitudinal study are increasing, what are decreasing, and what's staying the same. So they're going to create a, a database of this and present that to council and say, hey, look, what we're finding in the paperback forest is we've got this particular animal, you know, starting to disappear. Well, these ones, you know, are increasing, you know, and, and then start to hypothesise as to why that could be the case. Um, because right, you know, just down the road from where our school is at Caloundra, we've got Aura, which is the new city that uh, will supposedly held uh, 50,000 uh, people by the end of uh, the next decade. So there's going to be a huge impact on the, the, the biodiversity in the area. So that's uh, one of the projects that, uh, that the students will be developing at the end. So um, that sort of is what we're doing in our STEM. But one of the things, as I said before, you know, we want to work with you know the local community and if you know of any firms that may have skill sets that could you know link in with us you know I'd love for you to you know make contact with me um, my Twitter handle is at I teach ICT thought I did have that oh there it is yep so uh, you know please make contact any questions about what we're doing in STEM Uh, my role is uh, head of innovation, entrepreneurialism, and business, and then in brackets overseeing STEM. <laughs> yes. Yes. What's the most surprising project? The mo What's the most surprising project one of your students have come up with? I think with the, in terms of with the year nine, with the, the drone projects, um, one of the students looked at that initial design there and went, using those same pieces, came out with a stingray shape. And he said, I wanted something with less drag and using that, and actually found that quite, you know, worked quite well. And it didn't change anything other than, you know, using those pieces, exactly the same pieces, came up with that. In terms of with the, uh, the roller coaster, the, one of the students actually last year came up with a roller coaster that went underground, using the force there and was able then to do an underground part and then come back out to the surface. A little bit like, you know, and she, you know, she got her inspiration from an old uh, pinball, machine where some of the, the balls would go around the top and then go underneath and you go, well, where's it going to come out? And then it would pop out. And that's where she got that sort of idea. She went, oh, I haven't never seen that with any other roller coaster ever. So came out with that there. I think with the, the light optics, I think the, the boy with the, uh, the bicycle you know, and having the extra lights around the rim so it can actually be spotted side on rather than from front on or from the rear end. I think that was, you know, really, you know, Amazing for him to have come up with that because he wanted that safety aspect. Thanks for this talk. Um, I, I got here a bit late, so maybe I missed something, but um, do you have sometimes projects that uh, put several people together, working together as a team, and if so, how do you match maybe different skill sets? Yeah, or different uh, great, qu great question. So with our second unit of underwater drones, that will be a group project of four people. Uh, so we're going to be spending a bit of time about team management uh, and undertaking roles and you know, what their responsibilities are. Uh, when they do a, the, with the light optics, um, they're also doing the, the solar ovens as well. Uh, that's also a, a group project as well, uh, that they work with that, you know, so they come up with several prototypes rather than just one for the group. They'll have several different projects and then evaluate them against each other within that group. We were very successful on the showcase evening. We had a, 
you know, well, we've had lots and lots of sunny days last year, uh, and the solar ovens worked exceptionally well last year, and they were able to bake cookies uh, for the, uh, the showcase evening. Well, thank you very much for coming along and, um, you, know, you know, keep contact uh, on, on Twitter or, you know, after the event as well. Thank you.